All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Gary Lloyd Lester, and welcome to the 10 o'clock workshop that we're having this morning, Singing in a Strange Land, Suicide Prevention for Black Youth. And it is my pleasure and honor to uh, introduce in a moment, Dr. Sherry Davis Moloch, uh, who also has a Master's of Divinity. Dr. Moloch is the Associate Professor, the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences in George Washington University. I just wanna cover some brief housekeeping issues for the session, as you probably noted, is being recorded and you can find the recordings posted on the platform for 30 days after the conclusion of the symposium. They will also be added to the SPCNY website and a link will be shared with participants post symposium. Continuing education credits will be provided post symposium once attendance is confirmed and once the evaluation survey is completed by the participant. Evaluation surveys will be sent via email to all attendees of the session at the end of each day of the symposium. All handouts are linked on the auditorium page next to each webinar. Uh, you can add handout, you can uh, include those handouts and download them afterwards. Uh, we are asking people to save your questions until the end of the workshop. You will see that there is a Q&A function. Uh, please also don't use the raise hand function if at all possible. Uh, you can save your questions until the end or if you want to uh, put them there earlier on, that's fine, but we will be holding the questions until the end. And I believe that covers all of the housekeeping uh, issues. And so with that, again, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Moloch from the Department of Psychological and Brain Services at George Washington University. Thank you, Dr. Moloch. Thank you so much for that introduction. And I wanna thank the Suicide Prevention Center of New York State for inviting me to do this talk and a special acknowledgement to Jay Carruthers who was actually the person who extended the invitation. So I'm gonna be talking to you today about suicide prevention for black youth. And the title of the talk is Singing in a Strange Land. And that comes from, well, let me tell you a little bit about myself and then I'll tell you where the title comes from. So normally when I introduce myself, I have this collage. This is a collage that I have my students do because it talks about um, who you are and all of who you are, you bring to the endeavor, whether you're doing research or you're doing clinical work, your context also shapes what happens. And so the top layer of, of pictures is my family. My dad is the first one, he's 95 years old and still going strong. So I have a little bet with him that he has to at least try for 100. My husband and I um, co-pastor the beloved community church. So that's the two of us together. Um, my adult, young adult children, my oldest daughter, um, I have a girl, boy, girl, and my two grandchildren. The middle here has to do with I'm a pet lover. I have two dogs, one of whom is with, in here with me right now. So hopefully she'll be quiet. My research focus is on suicide prevention and HIV prevention amongst black youth usually trying to do these um, intervention programs in the context of a faith community. I'm also a licensed psychologist. And then my fun sort of hobby things are needlepoint, watching Korean dramas, eating as much Thai food as possible, and also doing Zumba so I can take off the calories I put on. So this is me in a nutshell. And again, this also informs who I am, informs my work, and it also informs the questions I ask, and that in turn forms the, um, the range of answers that we can have. So the title of this, of this talk comes from a psalm, uh, which is Psalm 137 verses one through four. And this is, psalm was written during the time when the Israelites or the Hebrew people were under Babylonian captivity. And they were really oppressed and they were trying to figure out how they could understand what was going on and why they were held captive, but also how to sing even in the context of adversity. And I like the song, the song because I think it really captures what people are struggling with with mental health challenges is how do you learn to sing your own song even in the midst of depression, even in the midst of anxiety disorders, even in the midst of adversity like um, COVID-19, even in the midst of things like the um, current spotlight on racial injustice, even in those contexts, how can we help people still 
strive and thrive to be whole and to be healthy and to have good mental health well-being, which is a challenge. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. How do we sing in a strange land? The objectives for today are learning new information about suicide prevention with the focus of suicide for youth prevention for youth from communities of color. How do we apply that knowledge about suicide prevention in ways that are culturally relevant and culturally salient for people from those communities? And to understand the importance of using a culturally salient approach in suicide prevention, risk assessment, and even in our referral practices. I wanna start off with just defining terms. You probably have heard this already sometime today or yesterday or, or tomorrow, but I just wanna make sure we're all, we, when we use the terms that we use, we all mean the same thing. So suicide ideation are thoughts of harming or killing oneself. And the severity of the suicide ideation can be determined by assessing how often the thoughts occur, how intense they are, and how long they've been going on. A suicide attempt is a potential injurious behavior that is directed towards the self. And really importantly, where the person's intent is to die as a result of the behavior. A suicide attempt may or may not result in injury, Many suicide attempts do not um, end up, people don't end up getting medical care for them. And then suicide is a death caused by self-directed injurious behavior, again, with the intent to die as a result of the behavior. And currently suicide is a 10th leading cause of death in the United States. When we look at this picture, this is just kind of this pyramid that's typically used. You can see at the bottom of the pyramid that um, almost 1.5 million adults make a suicide attempt each year. And about half of that number received medical attention for a suicide attempt. And then about two thirds of those people end up having to be hospitalized. And then about a 10% of that group actually ends up with suicide deaths or fatalities. So we can see that the tip of the iceberg are suicide deaths, but a lot is going on before people get to the to point of um, having a suicide fatality. And so we, I think it's interesting because a lot of times we want to focus a lot on suicide deaths, but as we can see relative to the attempts is a relatively rare behavior. And we also have to remind ourselves that suicidal thoughts are a sign of someone is troubled. And so while suicide attempts, we want to prevent deaths, we also want to intervene um, definitely when people are having thoughts and hopefully even before that. When we look more closely at uh, black American youth, Suicide is the second leading cause of death for youth ages 10 to 19. Suicide attempts rose by 73% between 1991, over almost of a, a uh, 20 year period, over a 20 year period for black adolescents, while injury by attempt rose 122%. Most of that has been driven by black boys during the same time period. And then we also know the landmark report that was done by Bridge about six years ago, found that suicide rates for black children ages five through 12, had doubled that of white children. That was the first time that that has been recorded. We also know that the suicide rates um, for both ideation and attempts are higher for youth from the LGB community when compared to their heterosexual peers, and that rates for suicide attempts are higher for LGB college students from communities of color when you compare them to heterosexual white students and also compare them for heterosexual students from communities of color. So this is a big concern. This is just some pictures of the National, Risk, National Youth Risk Behavior Survey. This is their most recent data from 2019. This is um, a survey that's put out every two years by the CDC. So you look at the data and look at high school students who felt sad or hopeless most of the time over the, um, the past 30 days before while they're taking the survey. So the national for all youth of, the, of this age group is 36.7%. So as I said earlier, suicidal thoughts are actually pretty common. We can see that the rates for feeling sad or hopeless are about double that for females compared to male students. That ninth graders are significantly less likely to um, think about having sad thoughts of sadness or hopelessness. And that the group that has the highest um, feelings of sadness or hopelessness are Hispanic youth followed by white youth and black youth. I want you to pay attention to this because when we get to suicide attempts, these differences in racial groups will change. This is the percentage of high school students who felt sad or hopeless looking at sexual identity and sexual and gender expression. So we can see overwhelmingly that gay, lesbian, and bisexual youth are significantly more likely to have these feelings compared to heterosexual youth 
and those students who are what we call questioning students. And when you look at their partner, their um, sex partners, um, you will also see the same uh, mirroring data so that students who have same sex partners or both sex partners who have bisexual behavior are significantly more likely to have thoughts of sadness or hopelessness um, compared to their um, heterosexual peers. This is looking at the same group of people, but looking at the people who had considered, seriously considered attempting suicide. Again, females are almost twice that of males. There's no significant difference in age in terms of grades. And when you look at this, blacks are significantly less likely to, to report seriously attempt, considering attempting suicide compared to white youth. When we look at um, sexual gender minority students, again, unfortunately, gay, lesbian, and bisexual youth are significantly more likely to seriously consider attempting suicide, particularly compared to their heterosexual peers. It's almost three times. In fact, it's over three times the rate. And then the same is true when you look at their um, opposite versus same-sex partners. And then now notice that when you look at who actually attempted suicide, again, females are almost twice as likely. There are no differences in grades, but now that picture is from earlier has flipped. So that black youth are significantly more likely to have attempted suicide compared to white youth. And this is also true of Hispanic youth. And so that has been a change, that trend has been changing for about the last five years. And then again, looking at sexual minority youth, the gay, lesbian, or bisexual youth are significantly more likely to have attempted suicide. So have questioning youth compared to heterosexual youth and compared to those who have same sex or both sex partners. Now let's, let's take a little bit of a moment to look at risk factors. So risk factors are characteristics that increase the likelihood that a person will um, develop problematic behavior. Risk factors can change over time. Risk factors for suicide amongst all um, youth include family history of suicide, a history of depression or other mental health challenges, incarceration. This um, risk factor is some, while it's true that it's a risk factor for all youth, it is also true that it is much more of a problem for um, black youth and Hispanic youth because they're more likely to have detentions in schools and those detentions in schools are more likely to, to result in expulsions and those expulsions are more likely to eventually lead those young people to um, the prison pipeline. And so they are really disproportionately impacted by this. Easy access to lethal means is really important. Clearly you wanna have enough time and space between the, um, someone feeling suicidal and having access to particularly lethal means. ETOH is alcohol and drug use. We know that young people are 50% more likely to make a suicide attempt when they are intoxicated either with alcohol or other substances. And part of that is because um, their judgment is impaired. And part of it is also because their behavior tends to be more impulsive when they're intoxicated. Exposure to the suicidal behavior of others, almost unique to young people. There's a, a concern about um, having modeling behavior or copycat suicides called a Werther effect. And so one of the reasons why we wanna be really careful of how we report suicides in the media, social media or traditional media is because when things are romanticized or glamorized in terms of the death or the method that's used, you're more at risk to have copycat suicides. Residential mobility is an important factor. I'm gonna say this later on, but I'm gonna say this again. One of the most important ways that we can prevent suicide is to make sure that people have stable housing, they have food security and stable employment. That if we can give people the basic um, their necessities are fulfilled and are stable, then a lot of the stress um, and risk factors that are associated with suicide decrease significantly. As I said earlier, being a member of a sexual minority group, certainly stigma, not just stigma about suicide, but also stigma about mental health and stigma about mental health, um, health seeking behaviors. All of those things need to be also significantly decreased. Having some type of loss, it could be a relationship, with, um, it could be stressful uh, family relationships. It could be stressful relationships with peers. It could be a romantic partner relationship, having social losses, work and finances. And somewhat unique also for black youth and, and Latino youth is being exposed to racial discrimination. And more recently we see anti-Asian discrimination as well. And, the, and not just the discrimination, but being exposed to the videos of 
um, people being murdered by the police, people being traumatized by the police creates trauma in and of itself. And particularly on social media, when those images are playing over and over again, watching those kinds of videos are traumatic in, them, in and of themselves. So there are some cultural differences in risk factors. And so we know that loss of face can lead to suicidal thoughts in Asian community. A culture of stress is a risk factor for Latinx um, youth. And as I said earlier, experiencing racial discrimination places African-Americans at risk. Okay, protective factors are characteristics that help people adapt to different levels of hardship. So in suicide prevention work, what do we want to do? We want to decrease risk factors and we want to increase protective factors. And we want to do those things simultaneously. So protective factors can be grouped into five categories. This again applies to youth across all different racial and ethnic groups, having strong family support and relationships, religious and spiritual engagement. The reason why religious and spiritual engagement is more prominent in black communities is because African-Americans or black Americans attend church more than any other racial ethnic group. About 89% of them attend church at least occasionally. They're much more likely to um, attend more often. They're more likely to belong to a faith community or institution more formally. And even if they don't go to church or go to a mosque or a temple, they're more likely to engage in what we call private devotion. So that could be reading holy um, text, that could be um, spiritually meditating, that could also be listening to, um, uh, for example, gospel music. Having community and social support in your community, um, personal factors like positive self-esteem and emotional well-being. And then, as I said earlier, and we'll be saying ad nauseum, stable family housing, income and employment. If you can have people's basic needs met, then it really helps to reduce the stress load quite a bit. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the importance of being socially connected, particularly because I think in the context of COVID-19, this protective factor has been eroded quite a bit. So social connectedness on the individual level are the number and particularly the quality of the social connectedness you have with friends, family, and acquaintances. And so when people have to self-isolate in the context of the COVID pandemic, and when people are no longer able to meet with friends or um, have immediate access to their acquaintances and close family ties, that really, really erodes that protective factor. And then on the community level, living in a socially cohesive community. In some ways in, during COVID-19, we've actually seen an increase of socially cohesiveness in communities in some communities. So you may have seen on the news where families get together on a block and have, we've seen people like play sports and play games together, neighbors getting out and on their deck or on their porch or and their cul-de-sac and having a daily glass of wine or having watching movies together, things like that really make a cohesive community and having a sense of belongingness, right? That you um, feel like you are connected to not just yourself. But on the other hand, that depends on what, where you live. That depends on whether or not you have the space to engage in things like that. And so that's really important. And then other institutions where people normally gather to have a sense of social support like school, um, like in a faith community, those things have been more challenging with the COVID-19 pandemic. So a major source of a protective factor has been eroded because of that. And then along with that, one of my favorite concepts is mattering. Mattering is when you feel like you make a difference in the lives of other people, that people don't just notice your presence, but they notice when you're not there. People care about what you think. They care about what you say and how you feel. They celebrate with you when you're successful. They lament with you when things aren't going quite as well. They depend on you and they appreciate you. And the reason why I love mattering is because mattering is something, and also social cohesiveness and collectiveness, um, is something that faith communities can really engender. You can be working in a low menial job outside and you could be feel devalued by the broader society, but your faith community in big ways and in small ways can make you feel like you matter. And I know um, in our faith community, in our church, we've been doing our services virtually, but what we have done is stepped up what we do virtually so that people will have a sense of connectedness. So right, right now we meet regularly at least three times a week in my church. We have um, stress management, um, which I lead on Tuesday evenings. We have, um, we have game nights, we have pajama day, we have 
Um, we also have, um, we've started a book club, which has been fantastic. So every other week we have a book club and we read different books and we read regular books like everyone else reads. We read, right now we're reading Stephen King's book, Billy Summers, and we'll have a, we'll have a discussion about that. Uh, we also um, have our regular Bible study and then we have our Sunday service. And even during the Sunday service, we put up a collage similar to the one I showed you earlier where people send me pictures every week and I post these pictures. And so why do we do that? It's a way for us to make people know you're socially connected. When I haven't seen someone in church in a while, I will text them, hi, how are you doing? We also um, have our, our service streamed live on Facebook and we also tape it. So we really, when the pandemic started, we were very concerned that people would end up feeling socially isolated, which we know is a risk factor for suicide. And so we were very intentional about making sure people were socially connected and also making sure that people mattered. So we post birthdays, we post children graduated from high school and college, we post everything we could possibly post. Uh, we've also unfortunately had to do funerals during COVID and so virtual funerals. And so we make sure that people, we acknowledge their loss and, um, and take care to really check after people. Because again, with COVID-19, the normal ways that we ritualize that we normally um, help to feel people feel supported during the loss of a loved one, those mechanisms are now gone because of COVID. So it means you, it doesn't mean that you can't still show up protective factors, but you have to be very purposeful about how you do that. Life risk factors, uh, protective factors are, can be very complex. So for example, we know that religious involvement can be protective against suicide, but we also know that there are cultural and religious prohibit, prohibitions against suicide. And so trying to find that balance where the, the religious prohibition may make it um, less likely that someone will complete suicide or make an attempt. On the other hand, that also can prohibit people from seeking help in the faith community. So it's really important to, to balance um, making sure that the religious prohibition um, is there, but it's not there in a punitive way and it's not there in a way that makes it hard for people to connect to you or to seek help. So everyone is asking about COVID-19 and the impact of COVID-19. So in the black community, we sometimes say that, that people of color or people from the black community are, are experiencing what's called a syndemic. A syndemic is when you have multiple pandemics occurring at the same time. So in addition to the impact of COVID-19, as you all know, there's been a current focus on racial injustice in this country. And I say it's a refocus because racial injustice has always occurred, it's not new. Um, but what is new is the sort of national spotlight on this. And some of this, obviously an example of that is the death of George Floyd, but it's certainly not the only example, unfortunately. So we know that um, we could probably surmise that COVID-19 pandemic and the spotlight on racial injustice can create uh, mental health challenges, mainly because these kinds of events typically create stress job insecurity, housing insecurity, food insecurity, all the things I talked about earlier. And these risk factors disproportionately affect communities of color. So the industries that were most heavily hit in a negative way by the COVID-19 pandemic, hospitality, service communities, are also the, the, the professions where Blacks and Latinos are more likely to work in those industries. We also know that African-Americans and Latin, Latinx communities are more likely to live in multi-generational families. So the spread of COVID can be much more impacted negatively in those kinds of environments. Um, and we also know that the calls to crisis centers and hotlines when looking at data from last year have gone up 800%. So that's the good news that people are reaching out for help. But the, the challenge is that African-Americans don't typically use hotlines. So we need to find ways to make that more attractive to them or do better outreach with that. We also know that economic downturns can lead to suicide increases. For example, we know that during the housing recession of 2008 to 2010, the race did increase. Okay. There's also a recent study that came out of Johns Hopkins at the end of last year, which compared suicide deaths pre-COVID to death rates after COVID in the state of Maryland. And they found that suicide deaths for black residents doubled when compared to pre and post COVID rates and the rates were cut in half for whites. And I think that again, as I just suggested that the um, negative impact of COVID 
is disproportionate in communities of color. And also that the rates probably reduce for whites because they have greater ability to work from homes. They're more likely to have a job that, that allows them to work from home. Um, they have access to better health care and more benefits for economic relief efforts. All right, let's talk a little bit about barriers to treatment. So unfortunately, there are significant racial and ethnic disparities in the use of mental health treatment due to structural barriers and social determinants of health. The rates of engagement in treatment and treatment completion are lower in Black adolescents compared to white adolescents. Part of this is due to a negative perception of the systems of service providers and the reluctance to acknowledge symptoms. So one of the things um, when I do these workshops or seminars or webinars, I ask providers and if there are providers out there, how easy is it for your clients, your patients to access your service? And I don't just mean where your, your center or your clinic is physically located. I mean, like once people get into the door, how are they treated? Are they treated with respect? Are they treated cordially? Do they have to fill out tons of paperwork? Um, is it hard for them to even figure out where the service is? I've recently experienced this in my own life. My brother unfortunately had a stroke in April and he's on Medicare. And prior to um, his having the stroke, I have never tried to have to access or navigate the Medicare system. I consider myself to be somewhat of a sophisticated consumer because of my research area. And I can tell you from personal experience, it has been a nightmare trying to get my brother basic services. It has been a nightmare in the context of COVID just to get him a primary care physician, to go to specialists, it's taken a lot to do that. And each step of the way has been very frustrating. And can you imagine for someone who's recently suffered from a stroke, how challenging that is? And so basically my, I took over that that part of his navigating his care because for him it was very frustrating and he's already dealing with the physical disability that, that resulted from the stroke. So having tried to navigate that kind of a system um, was very challenging and he was not always treated well in the different systems that he was interacting in. So I think you have to remember that when people feel really vulnerable, if you have a system that's so challenging to navigate, people often give up or they don't really feel like the service is for them. And we also know that research supports that because Blacks on average receive, poor, receive poorer quality of care than whites. We also know that um, Black youth are less likely to report symptoms, so there's underreporting. And I think there's a tendency for us to, they're called hidden ideators, because um, these young people are less likely to report, for example, suicide ideation. But in a way, we're almost kind of blaming them, right? We're, we're kind of saying that, well, since you don't answer the questions in the way we want you to ask them, that's your fault. And it's not your, it's your fault that you don't get treatment, as opposed to thinking maybe there are more culturally relevant and salient ways to ask these questions that will get at the, the information that we need in the way that the young person understands it. So one of our challenges is we, we assume that suicidal thoughts and depression, for example, are universally expressed the same way in all cultural groups. And that probably is not the case. And that maybe we need to ask a different set of questions to get the information we need so we can be the most helpful to the person. We also know that black youth are less likely to receive outpatient treatment, even when you account for other variables and that black youth are less likely to receive care for depressive symptoms and suicide attempts. And again, as I said earlier, black youth in general are less likely to, to uh, report depressive symptoms and when they do report depressive symptoms, they're more likely to talk about um, being frustrated, um, there may be some um, aggressive behavioral issues going on, and they may um, complain more about somatic complaints. This is, this is what I just said, the black youth express these symptoms differently. Black youth are more likely to be referred for inpatient treatment. And black youth, as I said earlier, are more likely to, to receive disciplinary sanctions in school which leads to juvenile justice system for them, which then leads to um, in, 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 inpatient treatment. And then the assessment tools, as I said earlier, are not designed to assess cultural specific expressions of depression. And so again, we have to ask ourselves, um, are the traditional measures or questionnaires that we use to assess or even screen for depression, is that a one size fit all? Or do we need to have more nuanced in the way that we question, um, ask questions so that we can get at this phenomenon? 
um, for Black youth. We also know that community norms don't really support seeking professional mental health services. One of the reasons why I started developing um, suicide prevention programs and depression programs in Black churches was because I realized that people were not coming to see me as a licensed clinician. And, um, and I was very struck by that 20 years ago that people would talk to me very comfortably about depressive symptoms and anxiety symptoms. But as soon as I put on my mental health um, practitioner hat, people were becoming very numb and very uh, mute. And people were really afraid to use those services. People were very afraid of being labeled by not only the profession, but also by neighbors. Um, people felt more comfortable talking to clergy. And clergy um, are basically, for many people, are one-stop shopping. So you, people go to their clergy person or their pastor or their priest for lots of different things. They can go for family problems. They can go for um, economic resources. They can go for spiritual counseling or spiritual support. But they also go for mental health support. And many people don't differentiate mental health treatment from what a clergy person can do. And so we know that um, for many young people, particularly males, seeking professional help is a last resort. We also know that mental health help seeking may be more stigmatizing for Black youth. They're more likely to discuss um, problems, mental health challenges with family members, and they in turn are discouraged from sharing that information with what people call outsiders, which could be teachers, um, counselors at school, or mental health professionals. And we also know that their peers may not be supportive of them seeking help for mental health um, concerns. Then there's the public health challenge that black and Latin, in the Black and Latinx communities, the suicide rates are highest amongst Black and Lat Latinx youth. And those communities are disproportionately young. So that means that those communities are disproportionately impacted by those rates. So we need to identify culturally salient risk and protective factors at the individual, family, and community level. We also need to develop culturally sensitive and relevant programs that address how these um, disorders or these problems are understood in that community. And then we also need to think about developing programs within institutions in communities that can increase the sustainability and the implementation of the, um, of the um, prevention programs. So I'm gonna kind of just skip over this a little bit, but just, I've mentioned this already that um, one of the reasons why we don't know more about suicide and youth of color is because we assume universality we assume that everybody expresses and, and not just expresses, but understands what depression is in all groups. And then we don't have any psychosocial interventions because of that assumption that are particularly effective for racial ethnic groups. And when I talk to my colleagues about this, they'll say, well, there's no reason for us to assume that they're different, but there's no reason to assume that they, they aren't either. <laughs> so it's an, it's an empirical question. Um, Many and many of the research studies that you look at for suicide prevention programs, youth from communities of color either are not identified in the sample, they're not included in the study, or they're in insufficient numbers for you to analyze treatment outcomes by race. We also know that there's disparities in the funding of researchers from communities of color. Why is that important? Because they're more likely to do this research in the first place. And in a recent review, black, black investigators were found to be half as likely to receive NIH funding from white investigators at every level of funding from submission rates to grants being discussed in review committees to the impact scores received. And as a person who has reviewed grants for 20 some years, if your grant is not, review, is not discussed in the review meeting, you don't have impact scores. And if you don't have impact scores, except from the initial reviewers, then you really don't get the feedback that you need so that you can improve the grant and resubmit. So what can we do about all of this? How can we reduce risk factors, increase protective factors so that we can help our children not just survive but thrive? And what can we do to minimize or eliminate risk factors and enhance these, these protective factors at the individual, family, community, and even broader level? So I suggest that we take a more upstream approach. This is a, a, a picture that I got off of um, a prevention program that's done at the University, I think of Iowa and their campus and it's called Brick, Building Resilience in Campus Community. And I love the picture. So you can see the people crossing the bridge. This is an upstream approach. So rather than waiting for people to fall in the water or you know, uh, really 
in, in, uh, treat, in trouble when they're falling over the waterfall itself. And if you look at it, that's where most of our care is, is tertiary. So people falling over the waterfall, they're at risk of drowning. And then we're there with the ambulance to give them a buoy and pick them up out of the water. But it also means what happens is we lose people, right? Some people don't ever make it from falling off the, on the falls. But rather than wait for people to fall over in the falls, why don't we pick them up way before that? Or better yet, let's prevent them from falling in the water in the first place. And so that primary prevention approach is building that bridge over the water so that people don't fall in to begin with. So these are some strategies for um, suicide prevention. This is a picture that I use in teaching my developmental psychopathology class. And it talks about the fact that when we're looking at um, the, the typical ways that individuals grow from infancy up through adulthood, that what we want people to do is to, to thrive and, and do really well. And so we want to have a positive adaptation, right? The pathway B, which is purple, my favorite color. And then we're looking at how children acquire competence, both in terms of academic work, in terms of motor abilities, in terms of emotional abilities. And we want young people to engage in age appropriate skills and abilities. And so we wanna make sure that, that kids can do that. And this is not just bio biology, right? This is also what kind of environments are they in where they are able to thrive and be and socially and emotionally and um, academically competent. But for some young people, there's a detour because they're in uh, maladaptive environments or they have maladaptation going on in their homes. And so those kids, are on pathway A that's in the red and they have repeated failures of adaptations. And so rather than growing up being that big tall tree that they were designed to be, they get sort of detoured along the way. And then you also have young people who are kind of on pathway C, they meet, they have resistance, they have adversity, but because of resiliency, following that maladaptation, they're able to, to thrive anyway. And those are the kids that we label as being resilient. And then we have another group of kids, that's pathway D, who initially are, are thriving and developing in good competence skills and good competency skills, but then get derailed because of negative changes typically in their community. Now, people love that analogy, but one of my challenges I'm gonna to give to you is that do, when we talk about kids being resilient, and that's a good thing, but we talk about kids sort of busting through at no any kind of adversity. These are kids who thrive no matter what. And we and the analogy that we usually use for that is their dandelions, right? That they can burst through concrete. And so in a way that's to be applauded, but then we have to ask ourselves, why are we requiring children to burst through concrete? Why don't we provide the soil that we provide for lilies? Lilies are beautiful and they're very delicate, but the reason why they grow and thrive is because the soil is so good. And so in some ways, we are called to be gardeners, right? We are called to till the soil and provide good nurturing environments so that rather than having to be a dandelion busting through concrete, you shouldn't have concrete as your foundation to begin with. You should have the enriching soil that allows you to be a lily as well as a dandelion. Because the thing is, dandelions can also grow in the soil that lilies grow in, but lilies cannot grow in concrete. So how can we do that? So my ad nauseum plea, <laughs> plug one more time is, if we can strengthen basic economic supports. Every child in the United States should have financial security. They should grow up in stable communities, have stable housing, and have job training programs to increase financial viability. Everyone should have that. We should also um, strengthen access and delivery of suicide um, and, or mental health care. And so coverage of mental health conditions and insurance policies, but really importantly, can people navigate through your system fairly easily? I mean, when I was trying to help my brother and still I'm helping him today, I sometimes feel like I need a PhD in navigating Medicare because it's so frustrating. It's nothing, you can't get anything centralized. It's like talking to different providers say different things not really sure what services to ask for, not sure who to call to ask for what services. So imagine being in a mental health crisis and trying to navigate your system. Is that something that people can do readily or do they need a PhD to do that? We need to reduce provider shortages in particularly underserved communities and increase culturally competent providers. 
And as I said earlier, changing the system so it's easier to navigate. It's easier for people to ask for and receive help. We can also promote a sense of connectedness, peer norm programs that promote help seeking. We certainly know that there are inter interventions out there. Source of Strength is one of them. Youth Connect is another one that really um, helps to change norms, peer norms about help seeking behaviors and reduce um, stigma associated with mental health and suicide. Partnering with faith-based communities. A lot of times people assume that or presume that faith-based communities are very negative about suicide behaviors, but that's actually not true of all faith communities. And it's also true that these are communities that you can partner with that are actually open. We have actually did a needs assessment recently, which we're writing up now, of looking at um, black churches and what their, the feasibility of developing HIV prevention and suicide prevention programs in these churches. And while I'm not gonna deny that there are some obstacles, overwhelmingly, they are very positive about the prospect of partnering with mental health professionals and mental health researchers. The issue is we need to work out the things that might be barriers, and as opposed to when we find a barrier, we just give up and go, well, we can't do it there, as opposed to let's work together so we can see how we can deliver this program in a, in a space that's um, affirming, lacks judgment, that is not evaluative, which is one of the challenges of when you do them in schools, and you have an, a community or an institution that will help members and non-members alike. People love to help youth programs for young people, even the young people who live in the community who don't necessarily go to the church regularly. And you partner with and encourage community engagement with other community-based organizations. You can develop um, partnerships with schools. I have an example there. Um, when my son was in high school, I was very struck by, there was a group of orthopedic surgeons that basically partnered for free with local high schools and they were at every training and every game. And so what that did was it helped prevent injuries. And one could argue that they were also drumming up business, but really they were working on preventing injuries. And so the number of injuries for contact sports went way down because they had physicians there working directly with the teams. I said faith-based communities, community-based organizations, um, I know all three of my kids did um, sports and recreation, uh, boys and girl clubs throughout their, up until they went to college. And so there's all kinds of sporting activities, girls and boy scouts, family support centers, there's lots of different places. So some of our partnerships have to what occur outside of our own institution. So we need to do much better with outreach. And then can we work on teaching young people social emotional learning programs, which can be done in school or also in um, faith communities. You can also do parenting and family relational skills again in these community organizations. There are gatekeeper programs, crisis intervention, treatment for those at risk and treatment to um, really importantly, we need to make sure we have wraparound services so that kids don't fall through the cracks. So that once they're in particularly inpatient um, treatment, and they have to go to their then transition to outpatient treatment. A lot of kids get lost in that transition. And so do we have wraparound services and do we have um, even booster sessions after treatment is over to make sure that people know that they feel connected, know that they feel that they matter and know that people are checking up on them. And then unfortunately, if there is a suicide death, we also need to think about post-venture programs that particularly for young people, that's very important, as I said earlier, because we wanna prevent modeling effects. So do we have a crisis team that can go out to the school, can go out to the faith community, can go out to the community-based organization um, so that we can help people deal with the grief of the loss of the loved one? So our conclusion is that it does take a village. All of us can do this and work together on it. And I wanna thank you guys for having me and are there any questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Molak, for that inspirational and hopeful message. Uh, so we do have some questions. I'm going to start with those, and uh, I'll encourage folks, if there's anything else that you have, to put it in the Q&A. So the first question is regarding screenings. Do you have examples of screenings or holistic questions that might be more culturally relevant that can be used? Sure. So, um, so culturally relevant. To my knowledge, there are no screening programs that are culturally relevant. I think, um, do, are there screening programs that are available? Yes, there's Columbia Teen Screen that's available. 
There are also um, some of the suicide questionnaires. Suicide, there's a suicide ideation questionnaire that can be used also. Um, and then you can also go to, um, I actually can put this in, I think I can put it in. We don't have a chat, do we? Oops, okay, I can't put it in the chat. So there's also, if you go to sprc.org, the Suicide Prevention Resource Center. Also, I'm sure the New York State um, Office of Mental Health probably has resources that are listed there of different screening um, instruments that you can use as well. But is there one that's tailored specifically for people of color? Not to my knowledge now. Thank you. Another question is, with the reluctance to engage in treatment, what can help to support people to access and meaningfully engage in treatment? I think that's a great question. Um, one of the things that I work on a lot in my faith community is to normalize the conversation around mental health challenges above and beyond suicide. So um, in our church, for example, July is the national uh, black and indigenous people of color uh, mental health awareness every year. And every year we have, um, we have an activity which we got actually the idea we got from SAMHSA, which is called sharing our stories. So all of those statistics I showed you earlier, which are very impactful and very informative, but we need a face and a person behind that statistic because the numbers just don't really mean anything to people. So we have people in our congregation who have been touched by mental health challenges. It could be they themselves have experienced mental health challenges. It could be they have a parent or a child and every year, each week, someone shares their story. They can, it's just five or 10 minutes. They can share as much or disclose as much as they want. It has been amazing to me. And my church is pretty small. We have about 60 members, but it has been amazing to me, people's willingness to share their stories. We've had people talk about what it's like to parent a child on the spectrum. We've had people talk about what it's like to be their own parents had bipolar disorder, excuse me, or a serious mental illness, what that was like for them as children. We have people who have their own personal struggles. Um, and we really great is we've got men now to start talking about that. And we um, have leaders in the church talk, we have regular people talking. And so what has happened over the years in our church is that people talk pretty openly now about suicide. They talk pretty openly about being on medication. And we particularly wanted to, um, not that we're pushing meds per se, but African-Americans are much more reluctant to use medications for mental health challenges. And they're much more or less likely, they're less likely to go to a mental health specialist. So we talk particularly about that. So the areas that we knew when we were stigmatized were the things that we intentionally talked about. I've also done sermons about um, suicide. I've done sermons about mental health challenges. We have information in our bulletin. We have, SAMHSA does a great job with a lot of different brochures and little rubber bracelets. We put that stuff in the bathrooms. <laughs> so people are kind of inundated with it, but, but what we're trying to do is make the conversation normal. So that, and why? Because it reduces the stigma. So once we can start talking about the mental health challenges and increasing mental health literacy, and once we can reduce stigma, it becomes a lot easier. Notice I don't, we didn't, we don't diagnose anyone. We don't label anyone. So we, we intentionally use the word mental health challenges. We don't use mental illness or mental disorder because those terms are stigmatizing. And the bottom line is that if you wanna have a conversation about something, you have to start where people are, not where you want them to be. So we do that. We also do a lot of work in the community. We also get um, community leaders to have buy-in, which helps a lot because those are people who are highly respected in the community and people who listen. The messenger is really important. If you just have someone from the outside of the community come and talk about mental health challenges or suicide prevention, you don't have any credibility in the community. And to be honest with you, communities are tired of people kind of floating in and floating out during these special months, and then you never hear from them again. So while we focus on July for BIPOC um, uh, mental health awareness, and while we focus in, in September on suicide awareness, we talk about these issues every month. We don't wait for a special month to come. That's my long-winded answer, hopefully answer your question. It's such a great reminder that the messenger really matters and the message and the ability to share personal narratives, um, not to generalize, but this is how I'm you know, getting support and whatnot, just to have people start to think about, oh, okay, so yeah, there is hope, there is resources available. 
Uh, another question, there are so many societal institutional factors, for example, racism, oppression, marginalization on a mezzo and macro level that are in place that prevent the soil from being healthy and nurturing. How can this be addressed from a micro level as a mental health care provider? Great question. This is actually the, the thing we're struggling with in my ethics, my graduate class on ethics. <laughs> like literally, we just talked about this. So I think you can do both. I think you can certainly be an individual practitioner that uses culturally sensitive ways of treating people. But we're also the people that can engage in research to make to show how these uh, that the the problems with racism, for example, is not individual to individual; it's systemic, and we can challenge and try to dismantle those those things or those barriers that keep people back. We can be involved in going to meetings in the environment or in the community so that we can talk about the impact of policing, for example. We can be the people that go there and. Um, go to the legislature meetings and talk about your expertise. So I think, um, I'm gonna talk about my church again. We're really well known for um, human trafficking and for combating um, environmental justice. So we people in the church who that's what they do. That's their ministry. They're at those meetings when they're trying to put a toxic waste plant in the community because those, those plants tend to be in black communities and not in other communities. And so we're really diligent about that. So we don't look at mental health challenges at just the individual level. Yes, we want people to get treatment, but we also wanna be available to talk about and work on things that enhance people's qualities of life. So one of the examples I was giving my students was, um, one of the things that happens when a neighborhood is gentrified is that, which is gentrification, if you don't know, is usually a community that's been predominantly people of color and then more white people move in. So what tends to happen, and it's, I mean, we laugh about it, but it's not funny. You'll know that's happening because you'll see bike lanes going up. You will see billboards for um, alcohol and cigarette smoking and other substances go down. And so what, what prevents us from a person who lives in a community of color from having bike lanes? Because we know bike lanes are great, why? Because people get outside more. The more you get outside, the more you know your neighbor. It's also a good form of exercise and it's relatively inexpensive. So we don't necessarily need people to build a state-of-the-art gym in the community, but to have a bike lane or to have community gardens, all of these are ways that are pretty inexpensive that you can increase um, community cohesiveness, social connectedness, you can increase mattering, these things that we know are protective, and you can also create safer spaces so people feel safer to come out in the community. So why are we willing to invest in that when white people live in the community, but we're not willing to make those same investments, cost the same amount of money when there are people of color that live there. So those are some really basic things that you could advocate um, in your community. Can your organization do a mobile unit where people go out and do screenings, for example, in the community? Because the more that you quote unquote hang out in the community, the more people know you, the more they're gonna access your services. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, let's see, we've got a couple more. What type of strategies do you think communities and school systems can or should implement to help inform students more about mental health resources and especially what to do in a mental health crisis? So those are two good questions. I think the first part of that is using programs like Sources of Strength is great because it could be done school-wide and you have peer leaders for helping to connect young people who are struggling with a trusted adult who can then connect them to services. So what that program does is it destigmatizes mental health and mental health seeking behaviors. And that can be, and it's designed to be implemented school-wide. So that's something that everyone can benefit from. You can also teach young people what to do in the event that someone is having a crisis. And I I'm, I'm apologize because of time, I didn't have slides about that, but you can um, definitely give kids um, and teachers and trusted adults sort of a um, almost a one pager of things to do if someone's in a crisis and how you can support that person in the crisis. Also has some things about what you shouldn't do. Uh, don't leave the person, for example, be calm. Don't make judgmental statements. Uh, make sure you ask good questions and recognize that asking a person about their thoughts about suicide does not make them actually make an attempt. It is actually a source of relief for someone to finally talk to them about it. 
but also to stay with the person. So, and if you're not sure, you can also always call the 1-800-SUICIDE hotline because they will help you walk through what to do with the person who's in crisis. You can also do crisis training of staff, um, frontline people, EMT people, et cetera, so that everyone, and not just train, but also to do what I call booster sessions so that you keep your skills up. You know, other professions, people have trained, they don't train once a year and then never train ever again. They train periodically, like fire department people, EMT people train all the time to make sure they keep their skills up. And so we could do the same thing for this. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so uh, primary care is thought to be a less stigmatizing setting to receive mental health services. It's also a setting where visits are often short, 10 minutes with a primary care physician. For mental health clinicians working in that setting, do you have any concrete recommendations on how to approach screening for suicide that would allow for more openness? Yes, I love that idea. So we do have evidence that um, that doing screenings in primary care actually is pretty effective for all the reasons you just said. People, kids go to primary care physicians, hopefully on a regular basis. It's also a consistent person, hopefully. So you see the same person over and over again, you can develop a relationship. So while kids are waiting in the waiting room, you can do screenings there. You can make it computerized. So it's something they do really quickly. And then that way, if they, um, if they screen or test high on something, they can be followed when you actually go into the office for the visit. That's a really good thing to do. Um, the biggest challenge to, to doing um, primary care work is allowing primary care physicians, one, to get the training that they need and the time. There's a lot of pressure on primary care physicians to get people in and out of their office pretty quickly. So this has to be something that third party insurers have to also embrace so that people aren't doing eight minute um, visits. <laughs> it's spending a little bit more time with young people. And also then um, having either a mental health professionals embedded in the primary care practice, which has also been successfully done, or having a ready-made referral system. And all the prevention programs I've talked about where you link kids to services, you have to have the referral system in place first. Because for you, if you're gonna do the screening, if you're gonna do the primary care visits, and you don't have the mental health referral system available, then you're gonna have a, a huge increase in people who need help and know where to send them. And that's almost just as bad as not having done the screening at all. So in some ways you might say it's worse because you've now identified a need, the client or patient also know there's now a need and then you kind of leave them high and dry and hanging. So that, that referral system has to be in place. You can do it based on insurance or providers. You can do a survey or what we do with faith communities is we actually do it, look at geographic location, and then we look at the top four or five insurers for that congregation, and we create the list. And then you teach someone to keep the list updated, which is not that hard. You can get a high school student for community service hours to update the list, or you can get someone who's a member of the church to do that. But the list, the referral list is really, really critical. Super. Um, we've got time uh, for one more, and there's one more quick question. I think, are you aware of it? current research to develop a more culturally relevant screener? Um, there's actually a paper that's going to come out soon, so I would say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say more than that, but I think it's still embargoed, but yes. Wonderful. Um, lots of comments. Just uh, thanking you for the presentation this morning. And uh, with that, I want to remind folks that the next session We'll be starting uh, in a couple of minutes, and that's going to be a plenary with Dr. Uh, with Verna Little, best practices for primary care. And so, uh, with that, again, thank you, Dr. Molak, for this inspirational call to action, and thank you for the participation and the questions. We look forward to seeing everyone at the next workshop.